say hi to the students, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself today. And as a deal, when you're on campus, when you are back in school or you accept to come to CU Boulder, I want you to come tell me a little about you. Is that a deal? All right. <laughs> Someone's going to come to my office, right? Um, so I am obsessed with building better businesses, and I really do that through the intersection of leadership and diversity. And I actually have some good news for businesses. For the first time in 2018, the number of women CEOs outnumbered the number of CEOs named John. <laughs> yes! <laughs> and I say it's good news, but if you're John, you're probably like, ugh, that's not... <laughs> There's still more Jameses, so Jameses, you know, um, no worries, you're still number one. But I say this is good news because we know that having women in executive roles has a positive impact on organizational success. It means higher stock prices, higher return on assets. It means greater innovation. If you have more diversity in your organization, including LGBTQ, people with disabilities, women, and people of color, you create two more products per year than a less diverse company. That's amazing. So then why don't we have these massively diverse organizations, right? That's the question. And to get to the answer, I'm going to have you do something pretty strange. Just for a moment, I want you to picture a basketball player. Okay, who did you think of? You can shout it out. LeBron, Kobe, right? Pretty much everyone thinks of an African-American male, right? We're in Denver, so maybe a few of you said some nuggies. When I did this last year in LA, I think I got booed. <laughs> but why do we all think of an African-American male? Let me tell you, there are actually women basketball players, and there are white basketball players, but an African-American male is a prototypical basketball player. But that's important for another reason. If you think of the percent of African-American men in the US population, it's about 13%. Yet they comprise 74% of the NBA. That's why you think of an African-American male, right? But because of those numbers, on some level, don't you also think that black men are better basketball players? Probably, right? Most people agree, yes, this is true, we think. You do the math, your brain's pretty clever at figuring this out, the numbers make sense. So if I tell you that white men comprise 31% of the US population, yet 94% of the CEOs, wouldn't you also think that white men make better CEOs? This is where everyone's like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> Not me, <laughs> I never think that. And I'm not saying this to say anything against white men. I'll tell you a second secret about myself. I actually love white men. <laughs> Some of my best friends growing up were white men. My dad, white guy. My husband, white dude. My son is like a little white dude. So it's not about anything against white men. I just believe that we can create better organizations, more innovative organizations, if we have greater diversity, including white men. Which brings me to my next slide. That's like lots of white men. This is the 1953 Minneapolis Lakers, who's comprised of a team of white guys. So do you think in the 1950s, when people thought of a basketball player, they thought of an African-American male? No, they didn't. In fact, it was illegal for uh, African-American men to play in the NBA. But I put this up here to show you that our prototypes and our stereotypes of what it means to be a leader or a Rhodes Scholar can change as long as our society changes. Because our ideas are just formed by what we see. So you see that. You think of white guys as basketball players. So last year when I came to talk to See You Next, I went through these tools that I found through my research called the ABCs of Breaking Bias. So they are, admit it, stop trying to deny you don't have bias, we all do, I have bias too. Blind it, that's scrubbing resumes of people's names so you don't know who they are. Count it, basically measuring things, and then support it. And so when See You Next challenged me last year, what's next? What's next for your research? What would you say in a year? I didn't know, and I thought about it all year long. And I think I finally put this together a couple weeks ago because that's how hard it was to come up with what's next. And I finally did it. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> it, did, it took me a year to realize what's next is the DEFs of breaking bias and creating diversity and inclusion. So unlike the ABCs, which focus on how to bring in more diversity through selection, recruitment, 
The DEFs are what do you do once you've achieved that goal? You've brought in this amazing diverse talent and now how do you get the most out of it? And that's the DEFs. So let me start with the D, develop them. So my research shows that developing others is just a good leadership technique. It's just good leadership. But it's particularly important when you are leading diverse teams because if you're developing your employees, you're showing them their path in the organization and how they can grow and where you see them going, it means you believe in them. And that's all the more important when you have diverse groups who often feel the stereotype of maybe I'm just here because of the color of my skin or because of my sex. But when you develop your teams, they really see that you have a path for them and a belief in them and confidence in them. And they take that confidence for themselves. The E is empower them. So one of the great reasons we want diversity in terms of things like innovation is diversity of thought, having different perspectives, different viewpoints. Now, if you don't get people to share their diverse ideas and backgrounds and viewpoints, you're not really getting the benefit of diversity. But this is what we see in so many organizations. You hire in people who look different than the normal person in your organization, and then that person is silenced. And they leave, right? They, why, are, why am I here? No one wants to hear from me. But if you empower people to share their views, maybe asking everyone to speak at a table, or what Kevin Lofton, who's the CEO of Catholic Charities, does, appoint a devil's advocate at every meeting, who's always going to raise a dissenting opinion. And once one person raises a dissenting opinion, it's easier for everyone else to do the same thing. So empower people to speak up, share their views, make change, and do things differently. The F is fairly treat them. In organizations, there's two types of tasks. There's promotable tasks and non-promotable tasks. Promotable tasks might be things like um, landing a new client or turning a part of your business around, making major change, coming up with innovation. Non-promotable tasks are things like doing a PowerPoint, editing someone else's work, organizing an office party, and what we see is that those non-promotable tasks are disproportionately laid on women and minorities. And that's not even counting all of the office housework, like um, taking notes at meetings, mentoring all of the other women and minorities in the organization. So if you make sure as a leader that the tasks are fairly divided because you've already developed plans for people to go through the organization, you say, what do they need to succeed? And then make sure that they're equally distributed fairly. The S is support them, just like it was in the ABCs. We need support. We need to make sure that people who believe in diversity and inclusion are willing to stand up and share that. That means flying in front of the radar so everyone knows where you stand on this point. Okay, so what's next? Uh, I promise if I do this again, I will not have the GHI of uh, <laughs> diversity and inclusion. Um, but what's next really struck me when I was doing an interview with Mark Benioff, who's the CEO of Salesforce for some of my research. And he's been a champion of diversity and inclusion in his company. And he said, you know, they don't teach this stuff in business school. And I was like, oh, really? You're right. I actually teach in a business school. We don't teach this stuff. But we teach this at Leeds now. We are committed in our leadership, developing leadership students, to teach them about diversity and inclusion and innovation and making sure that the leaders of tomorrow are all from the University of Colorado Boulder. <laughs> Thank you.